Welcome to Regeneration Life Church on this beautiful, blessed Sunday, folks. The only thing good in me is what God has put in me. And let me tell you something, what God has put in me and what God has put in you, if you are a believer, is amazing. He comes to live inside you through the agency of the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. Now, today, oh, we're getting a little bit of feedback. Let me see if I can fix that. Ah, there we go. Maybe that's better. All right. Okay, I'm going to have to step over here and fix this. I apologize. Maybe it's just a little too loud. Hey, I'm the pastor and the sound guy. All right, here we go. I wear many hats. Some of them are actually nice hats. But at any rate, today's message is why Israel rejected Messiah, part nine. They didn't know that the Passover ceremony points to the Messiah. Now, last week we talked about uh, the Passover and we went through the scriptures in Exodus and we showed how they point the Messiah, pointed to point to the Messiah. Now we're going to look at the ceremony itself. Our texts. Hey guys, it helps if you turn things on. Okay. And you know what also helps? If you have the battery put in there correctly. I'll bet that'll help too. He's a good preacher, but he has the technical skills. Anyway. There we go. All right, so our texts. <clears throat> John 1.11, he came into his own, and his own received him not. We're still explaining why his own received him not. Okay? Uh, another scripture, John 5.39-40, search the scriptures, for in them he think ye have eternal life. This is Jesus speaking mm -hmm. to the Jews of the first century. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. John 5, 46-47. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? And then we have Luke 24, verses 26 and 27. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things, the things concerning himself. While the satyrs have started morphing into divergent forms starting after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the basic ceremonial form of the Passover was instituted long before the Messiah walked the earth. There are aspects of the Passover, of the Seder, okay, of, what the, of what's called the Haggadah, okay, uh, which is the ceremony of the Passover, that were added after the destruction of the temple. For example, um, at the end of the Passover, they say next year in Jerusalem. Now that was, uh, we'll explain that a little bit later, but that was added after the, the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Israel as Israel is, uh, and Israel. When the Jews had to be dispersed out of Israel. And next year in Jerusalem. So some other things were added later. But they still all point to the Messiah. We are not we are not going to go through the actual Haggadah, which is the step-by-step -step ceremony itself, as the four cups of wine will have their own message next week. Hello, folks. But we will show how all of the other elements and actions in the ceremony point to the Messiah. Now, before Passover, all leaven is to be removed from the house. Leaven, in many cases, is a representative of sin. It has to be removed. What this represents is found in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, the reason the Messiah came, 
He is found in Titus 2.14. It's not just to save us, but to redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself, a peculiar people zealous of good works. As in, he comes and he makes you into a person that wants to obey him. Now, moving on to the atmosphere of the Seder. The Passover is to have a calming, relaxed atmosphere. They're re they recline comfortably on pillows. It's very relaxed. It is very calm. This represents the peace that is brought by the Messiah. Peace with God, Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So not only do we have peace with God, which would be enough, he also gives us peace inside. You hear all these gurus out there talking about, this is the way to have inner peace. Let me tell you something. Following Jesus is the way to have inner peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus has given his peace to us. In another scripture, it is called the peace of God that passeth all understanding. It is a gift to us. As we follow the Lord, the Lord gives us not only peace with the Father, but peace inside. So it's a very relaxed atmosphere because it points to the Messiah's peace. The empty seat was for Elijah as he was to re return before the great day of the Lord. They would have an empty seat. And they would always check the door. They'd have one of the kids check the door. Nope, he's not out there. He's never shown up once. But let me tell you something. That seat is for the, the return of the prophet Elijah. Malachi 4, 5 says this. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Notice this is before the Lord's coming in judgment. The Messiah did not come the first time to judge, but to save that's his first coming, John 12, 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. So he did not have at that time literal Elijah. At Christ's first coming, we have John the Baptist, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. We see this in Luke 1, 17. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Okay, John the Baptist was not Elijah. He said it himself, John 1, 21. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Now, Elias is simply the Greek name for Elijah. Just like uh, Jesus is the Greek for, or actually, Jesus is the Greek, Greek for Yeshua. It's the same name in a different language. So this is, he's, they're asking, are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not Elijah. Jesus spoke of John the Baptist being Elijah metaphorically. It was metaphor. It, he was he's essentially referring to himself as Messiah, saying, hey, this is Elijah who is who's to, to precede me. It was metaphoric. It was not literal. We have to give God, uh, we have to give God the right, I guess you could say, to, <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking, I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek. We don't have to give God any rights. But at any rate, at any rate, we, we have to look at God and, and, and understand that he can also use figurative language. So, these verses are clear that John was not literally Elijah. The first coming is not dreadful at all for any of us, except for the Messiah himself who had to go to the cross. But the dreadful day of the Lord is a reference to the day of judgment. The second time Jesus comes will be that great and dreadful day. Make no mistake, June 14 through 15, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. I am not saying this in condemnation. I am not sharing this in condemnation. I'm sharing this because I want to give the whole counsel of God so that people can see this and go, I better get right with him. Because I want you in heaven. And not only do I want you in heaven, I want you to have every reward that would come to you. So I'm telling you, the whole counsel of God. And there is going to be a great and dreadful day of the Lord. Let's look at Malachi 4, 5 again. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Guys, again, this is the time of judgment. When all of the Messiah's enemies shall be made his footstool. Psalm 110.1 The Lord said unto my Lord. That's Yah saying to Adonai. Two names of God. Remember, God, God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Guys, this is Jesus. Hebrews 10, 12 through 13. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now, Elijah's return is found in Revelation 11. And I want you to pay very special attention to the ministries of the two prophets in Revelation 11, 3 through 6. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. The ministries of these two prophets indicate who they are. One is Moses, whose life force remained in his dead body. Deuteronomy 34, 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. He, he, his body contained all of his life force when he died. Now, the two prophets have power to send plagues on the earth and turn the water into blood. Who can forget? Moses is ten plagues that he declared to Pharaoh and they happened. One of them was turning water to blood. So one of them is Moses. The other is Elijah. Now Elijah never died. 2 Kings 2.11 And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So he never died. So these two prophets, it's logical. Okay, Moses, Moses' life force never abated, and Elijah never died. So we have two guys right there who are coming back. Notice, one of them is Elijah. So Elijah is coming back before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's love at one of Elijah's ministries. 1 Kings 17, 1, and Elijah the Tishbite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord... God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be a dew or rain these years, but according to my word. James 5.17 gives us more detail. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Elijah is one of these prophets, and will turn, return along with Moses, as the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And that empty seat at the Passover Seder is for Elijah. They're expecting his return. Well, he is going to come back right before God judges the earth. Now let's look at the lighting of the candles. The woman of the house, and it's always the woman of the house, says a blessing and lights the candles. Now why is this? Why does it always have to be the woman? Can't one of the kids do it? No, and let me tell you why. This represents the fact that the light of the world was brought forth as the seed of a woman. Jesus came as the light of the world, John 8, 12. Then speak Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And he was brought forth as the seed of a virgin woman. He has no paternal descendants other than God. Now, we understand that one of the genealogies, and we'll get into this in a few weeks, one of the genealogies is through Joseph, but Joseph was Christ's adopted father. 
jo and I'll show you this in the scriptures, that Joseph adopted Jesus. Okay, but his, his genetics were of the Virgin Mary. Genesis 3.15 is the very first Messianic prophecy. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, talking the serpent. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Look at this, between thy seed and her seed. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, and what a sign it is. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The Messiah, God with us, was brought forth by a virgin woman. I want to read this entire passage to you. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee and Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation it should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, look, even, even she's going, now, wait a minute, I'm a virgin, what's going on here? How shall this be, seeing as I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I'm going to tell you, this is a virgin woman. Now, how was her egg fertilized? Because the Holy Spirit came into her and fertilized her egg. Jesus' genetics is both God and man. And he was born of a virgin. That is why the woman does the lighting of the candles. She is the one. The woman brought forth the Messiah, the light of the world. Let's look at the Seder plate. Oops, sorry about that. I split it up there and I didn't give it to you, my bad. Okay. The Passover plate, the Seder plate, contains elements of the celebration, each representing some aspect of the Exodus out of Egypt. Now, we're not going to go through the actual Haggadah because one of the things is I'm going to talk about the four cups tell a story. And I'm going to give you that story next week. Okay, so we're going to skip over the four cups for right now, and I realize that if I, if I don't do it that way, then we're either going to be here all day or I'm going to have to cut it off in the middle, and I would really rather not do that. So, um, we're just going to talk about the elements of the celebration representing uh, what they represent. <laughs> anyway, so it contains um, the, the, the elements represent some aspect of the exodus out of Egypt, they also represent the coming Messiah. It has been said by the rabbis themselves that if you have two rabbis, you get three different opinions. So some Jewish families may celebrate differently. At any rate, so we have the three matzos. Now, matzah bread is, is baked as Christ was baked in both the Son and His Father's wrath on that cross. It is pierced as Christ was pierced. It is striped as Christ was striped. That is what matzah looks like. Many Jews place a plate on top of three matzos wrapped in linen. It's called the matzah tash. Even though Jews do not recognize Yeshua as the Messiah, it is clear that the matzah bread, which is unleavened and flat, it's, it is striped and pierced. Again, this represents the Messiah. The Lord said in himself, I am the bread of life, John 6, 5, 50, John 6, 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The akats is the breaking of the middle matzo. So you have three pieces of matzo bread. 
The one in the middle is broken. We have a Godhead that is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. The one in the middle, the Son, was broken. The Son is the one in the middle. And it's broken during the Akats. It is at this point in the Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples at the Last Supper, which John twenty two nineteen records, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It goes hand in hand, ladies and gentlemen, with Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look, when he comes back, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In other words, when Jesus comes back in the clouds, they're going to kick themselves for rejecting the Messiah. What about the linen? Remember how the three mobsons were wrapped in linen? The body of Christ was wrapped in linen. Matthew 25, 27, 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Fine linen, folks, represents righteousness. Revelation 19, 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and represents righteousness. That is the righteousness of the saints. Finding, I'm going to talk about finding and eating of the broken middle piece. The middle piece is broken, wrapped, and hidden before the meal. After the meal, children are sent to look for it. The child who finds it and brings it back to the leader is rewarded, either money or candy. Okay, so it, it is redeemed. The leader then unwraps the bread, blesses it, breaks it into small pieces, and then gives to everyone around the table to eat together. This is part of the Passover Seder in which Jesus said it represented his own body that was going to be broken for them. We've already gone through that. Okay? Remember, Jesus was the middle matzah who was broken, wrapped, unwrapped, and then becomes part of his disciples. Why? Because the people around the table are consuming him. Once it's wrapped, unwrapped, it's broken even further, given to everyone around the table to be eaten. God becomes a part of his disciples. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, Jesus comes and lives inside all of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have consumed by faith the Lord into your inner man. And he is a Savior who is hidden in darkness to the unbeliever. And once the soul believes, Christ is taken out of the darkness into the light in their eyes. And the person becomes like a child. The child has found that matzo. He's found that broken Savior. Mark 10, 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. We all need to become like children. The next element, and this is the first element to be eaten, because we're kind of skipping around, because we, I, I needed to show what each thing represents. But the first element to be eaten is what is called the carpus. Essentially, hyssop dipped in salt water. Some modern satyrs will use parsley as the salt water dripping off the parsley resembles tears. It represents the slavery and abuse Israel endured under the Pharaoh in Egypt and the hardship that came with it. Tears here also represent the repentance, gratitude, and love toward Christ experienced by a new believer who is freshly delivered from sin. Luke 7, 44-47, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wipe them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, 
But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. And to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And just as the tears represent the, the, the salt water dripping off, looking like tears represents the tears of the newly converted, it also represented the tears of hardship. And as we grow in Christ, tears represent the trials we must endure. John 16, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want, to sh I want you to look at this verse. Where in this verse does he ever say, name it, claim it, lab it, grab it, possess it, confess it? Ever. No. He doesn't say, oh, if you say you're going to have riches, you're going to have riches. If you say you're going to have a new car, you're going to have a new car. No. What he does say is in this world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Just a little sight out there. Spiritual growth. And obedience to the Lord requires consistent and strenuous effort and patience. I'm going to quote from one from uh, one commentator, Dan Stolbarger. We can't coast uphill. Instead, we have to exert effort, sometimes intense effort. And that can be painful enough to cause tears, not unlike the tears of frustration expressed in bondage. There are times when we stumble and fall. But the key to growth is the getting up, brushing ourselves off and moving forward, despite the pain and tears. It's a narrow road, just as Jesus said it would be. He also told us he would, that we would experience tribulation. So we press on, longing for the day when we will hear, Well done, a good and faithful servant. The carpus is a reminder that the pain and suffering are sometimes needed in order to grow spiritually. The carpus is a reminder that, according to James 1, 3 through 4, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The parsley of the modern Seder resembles the hyssop, which was used to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost. The parsley is used as a substitution. Well, let's look at hyssop. Hyssop represents cleanliness before God. Psalm 51, 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Hyssop was also used to lift a sponge full of vinegar wine to Christ's mouth when he was on the cross. John 19, 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Hyssop had a lot to do with cleansing, and as you can see, it was used... To, to put, to, when Christ said, I thirst, it was used to give him some vinegar wine. This took place after his blood was shed so that we can be clean before God through him. Actually, it took place, yes, it took place after his blood was shed. And after he cried out to God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was the time he took all the sin of the world upon himself. Ephesians 5 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might do what? Sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 1 John 1 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. The hyssop dipped in salt water also represents the tears Christ cried as He suffered to buy our salvation. Matthew 27, 46 says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lava neshachtanai. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Folks, Sin separates you from God. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Might not separate you from the love of God because he still loves you, but when you sin, you experience a broken relationship with the Almighty. Now Jesus is the God-man. And the Messiah is declared in both Old and New Testaments to be both God and man. 
As eternal God, Jesus always was with the Father in eternity. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As God the Son, Jesus cannot be separated from the Father, but we also know that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14 it was not in his divine nature that he experienced separation, but in his human nature. He took all the sin of the world upon himself and experienced a broken relationship with his father in his human nature. As all the sin of the world fell upon him. Sin separates from God. And he cried out, my God, my God, this is the only time he ever referred to the Father as God. And those tears are represented also by that hiss of dipped in salt water. We go on to the what they call the uh, Zoroa, the shank bone of the lamb. Now this represents the offering made on the eve of the Exodus, as well as the traditional Passover offering made the 14th of Nisan at the temple in Jerusalem. Some Messianic Jews do not include the Zeroah because Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice that ended all the need for sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 10, and 14, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Skipping down to verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Let me tell you something, if you've been born again, you have been perfected on the inside. And holy living is bringing that out. Those who do include the shank bone will not eat it because it is only there as a representation and a reminder of the perfect Lamb, Jesus Christ. This is among the Messianic Jews. The Messianic Jews um, who do not include it say that the Lamb shank should be left out because the final sacrifice has already been made. Now, I was at a Messianic Seder uh, many years ago. In fact, I'd like to do one here. Uh, when Passover rolls around again, I would like to, for us to sit down and do a Messianic Seder in this church. But I was at this Messianic Seder uh, in which the middle matzo that was broken was put in the place of the lamb shank. Instead of performing that at the end, they actually performed it at that time when they were supposed to eat uh, the, the meat. It was at that time, uh, and, and they also what they did is they, they did a Christian communion at that time as well. And um, I was actually at another one where they actually had like everybody bring a, a dish and they substituted that for the lamb shank. And that was pretty cool too. I kind of had a potluck meal uh, in the middle of the, of the Seder. That was pretty awesome. It was, a, it was a great experience. Next we're going to talk about the churro set. It's a mixture of apples, raisins, okay, um, sometimes in the hydrated form of grapes. Cinnamon, almonds, and wine that was placed next to the Zeroah. The color and the texture of the Cheroset was a reminder also of slavery, as it looked and felt like the mortar Egypt forced Israel to make to use bricks for Pharaoh. I only hope it didn't taste like that. But I have never tasted mortar, and I don't want to at any rate. But that was the representation. Uh, the, but all kidding aside, the flavor is sweet and pleasant, which speaks of the freedom God provided from Egypt's bondage. For us, it also represents the slavery of the world and our escape through faith in the Messiah. John 8, 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Romans 6, 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Not the church says it's made of fruit. Look at that. Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The ingredients of the cherub said also individually have meaning. The apples, Song of Solomon speaks of the apple of the eye, representing love. The raisins, which are essentially, when you think of raisins in the Bible, sometimes, uh, as a matter of fact, sometimes you can go to the the grocery store, and you'll, you'll get these grapes, and it'll say raisins on them. Okay, all it is is dehydrated grapes. That's what we consider raisins. Um, so the grapes represent fruitfulness. Cinnamon represents healing. Almonds represent watchfulness. 
And wine in the Bible in reference to God represents blessing. So here we have the cherish that representing slavery, but even in the worst of circumstances, God is with us. There is God's love. There's fruitfulness. There's healing. There's watchfulness. There is a great blessing. Now we move to the marora. It's made of bitter herbs, usually horseradish, romaine lettuce, and endive. In some Seder tables, it's eaten by itself, and sometimes it's eaten between two matzos as a form of sandwich. The Messianic Jews that eat it as a sandwich between the two matzos are they uh, who replace the lamb shank with the matzo seeing, um, and they see themselves as fulfilling the spirit of Exodus 12.8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. The bitter herbs are a reminder of the bitterness they experienced under the slavery of Pharaoh. Now for the follower of Christ, it represents the slavery, the slavery we were under as sinners without the Lord. Ephesians 2, 2 through 3. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. Which, by the way, in early Middle English, conversation didn't just mean speaking, it meant behavior. In times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. By nature. We were enslaved to our very natures to disobey God. Moving on to the bite cell. It's an egg that is hard boiled and then roasted, charred on both sides. The egg, folks, that's a representation of life. The roundness of the egg is said to represent the circle of life. Life, death, and rebirth. And the boiling represents suffering. The roasting and charring represents death. And after the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., some also see it representing the destruction of the temple. As for the Christian, it represents new life and resurrection. We're given new life in Christ. Romans 6, 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. And this new life is through the spiritual resurrection the born-again experience. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 5. And you have been quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And our spiritual resurrection, folks, will one day manifest into a physical resurrection. When Christ comes back to get us. Now again, next week we're going to look at the four cups of Passover in light of the Messiah. There's so much, it really needs its own message, guys. It tells the story. But, this is how they concluded. Now this was not in effect, because they were already living in Jerusalem. This was not in effect during the time when Jesus walked the earth, but it still has an application for us. After the Jews were dispersed out of Israel, every Passover service has ended with this. And as a matter of fact, they still say it. Next year in Jerusalem. This began centuries ago, but Israel was only reestablished in 1948 after 1900 years of literal non-existence. It only existed in the hearts of the people. It was not anywhere on earth. It was, it was crazy. It was done. It was done. There was no Jerusalem. They were always expecting its reestablishment. And Jerusalem has been now reestablished for over 70 years, but the Jews will still say this at Passover <clears throat> as a remembrance. Even though, as next year in Jerusalem shows, the hope of Israel always existed in the hearts of the people, the dry bones prophecy of Ezekiel was not fulfilled until 1948. Next year in Jerusalem was always an expression of hope that God would reestablish Israel in their lifetimes. Now, the Messiah's disciples both Jew and Gentile, his Talmudim, likewise, have this hope for the new Jerusalem. Romans 8, 23, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. This world and this universe is stained with sin. Romans 8, 20 through 22, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, 
because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The entire creation, from the, from the, the from the subatomic level to the end of the universe, is stained with sin, therefore it must be destroyed. And at some point in time, when God says it's time, it will be. Second Peter 3, 10 through 12, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. This entire creation is going to be destroyed, and in its place, Revelation 21, 1-2 says this, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea, and I, John, so the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 2 Peter 3.13, after 2 Peter talks about the destruction of the entire universe, he says this, Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Folks, Next year in the new Jerusalem. Yeshua. Jesus. Is truly our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed. For our deliverance from sin. Judgment and hell. He was born of a virgin. He's given us his light. He removes the sin from our inner being. He's given us comfort. He has taken. Our punishment. Listen, you can seal your eternity right now. Understand that your sin has offended a holy God. And that Jesus died on the cross for that sin. And I'm saying, don't become religiously lost. There are too many who are religiously lost. Matthew 13, the entire chapter talks about people who are religiously lost. I'm saying, get saved. Don't get religion, get Jesus. You need to understand your sin has offended God. That Jesus died on the cross for that sin. You need to understand your sin, my sin, all our sins, even the littlest sin put Jesus on that cross. Because no sin can be in the presence of God. Which is why he changes us from the inside and he's rid of that sin from the inside. And why one day we will be resurrected in glorified bodies that have no sin. As for now, we still have to walk around in these flesh suits and deal with the nonsense that, it, that comes with it. You need to understand your sin with the Son of God on that cross. You need to repent. Now, what does repent mean? We hear that word all the time. All the time. People talk about repent. Some people misdefine it and they, oh, it's a work. It's not a work. It's a change of mind. And it's a change of heart. Repent. What does that mean? You don't want to offend God anymore. Therefore, you don't want to sin anymore. That's what it means. You understand what sin did, and you don't want to do it anymore. Put your trust, your full trust in Jesus as the Messiah who died for that sin. Confess Him as your Lord and Savior. Bow your heart to Him. He willingly died for your sin. He, to deliver you from sin and hell. Tomorrow is not promised to you. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Please, come to Him. Give Him your whole heart now. Thank you, gracious Heavenly Father, for this day. It's a beautiful day, oh God. It's very nice. Lord, God, there is nothing good in me except what You have put in me. And I thank You, God, for what You have put in me. I thank You, Father God, that Jesus died on that cross to buy our salvation, and it would have been enough. But not only that, God, you put him, you put him on the inside of us through the agency of the Holy Spirit. 
God, you have come to live inside your people as a seal under the day of redemption. And God, I'm asking you, Father God, to bless each one, Father. If anybody has needs, Father, I ask that you meet them. Father, I pray that this message has brought someone to salvation and somebody who has been who has been away from the Lord to a closer relationship to Him. I thank you for all of this, Father. In the name of your Holy Son, Jesus, who died for our sins so that we can join you in eternity.